Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'll read verse 10 and verse 11. Philippians 3, 10 and 11. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let me say it as simply as I can. No resurrection of Christ, no Christianity. No resurrection, no salvation. It's as simple as that. Why is the resurrection of this one person, Jesus Christ, so important that you can't even have salvation without it? I'll never forget on that amazing day when my life was changed forever. When I first heard the gospel and was saved back in 1976, old Bob Price showed me in the Bible how Christ was raised from the dead. Before that time, my concept of Jesus Christ was limited to his death on the cross. Everywhere I turned, I saw Jesus portrayed as a dead person hanging on a cross, someone who would wear a cross, or you'd see a cross on a church building, and you'd see this dead person hanging on it. And I would say to myself, what does that have to do with me? Why are Christians making such a big deal about a dead person on a cross? And so when Bob explained that Jesus rose from the dead, I thought, okay, I can accept that. I can believe that. That is, after about six, seven hours of sharing the gospel with me, I began to think like that. But I didn't realize how important the resurrection was to actually make salvation possible. How can a dead person raise someone else when he himself is dead? How, and how resurrection power, how does it actually provide a living reality in Christians' lives? How does the resurrection of Christ affect people when he himself was dead? Of course, I didn't realize that he rose from the dead and all the teaching that was connected with it. And it wasn't until I heard the first couple of sermons about the resurrection after I became a Christian and the resurrection's critical role in Christianity that I understood its inestimable value in actually knowing God himself. We cannot even know God and enjoy fellowship with him unless somehow, some way, we are connected with him through resurrection power. And so why is the resurrection then, to make this relevant, important for us today? What difference does it make for the church? What difference does the resurrection make in growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't I just have to know about the resurrection and believe in it and just move on from there? How does the resurrection relate to me? The reality of it, where I live as a Christian in this world, how do I apply resurrection power to my life? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. You see, the resurrection of Christ isn't just a teaching. It's not just a doctrine. It cannot for the church remain only as a theological concept that we learn about, we agree with, we believe in, and then move on there, move on from there for the rest of our lives. However important the resurrection may be in our theology, you see the resurrection provides the power to become a Christian, provides the power to stay as a Christian, and to be able to overcome all the enemies that we face from the moment of our salvation until we are called up into glory. The resurrection is an ongoing experience in our spirits, in our spiritual man, that actually is the basis of our preservation as believers, but also as our proactive 
positive grounds for growth in the Christian life. And so therefore, for some believers who are not really taught about the resurrection and its critical role in sanctification, they view the resurrection as something they embrace, they agree with, they believe in, and then they file it in their theological file cabinet and never realize how critical it is to their actual joy and experience of the person of Jesus Christ in their daily walk. You see, the resurrection of Christ provides the power to become Christians. The resurrection provides the reality behind the words and symbols of Christianity. The resurrection provides the impetus in worship and the ability to worship God in spirit and in truth and in a way that pleases Him. The resurrection establishes the internal connection that makes Christianity supernatural, transformational, and a living reality. So if you're not a Christian or let me rephrase that. If you are a Christian, but you've dismissed the resurrection and reduced it to a place of unimportance and irrelevance when it comes to growing in the grace and knowledge and power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've made a big mistake. You need to review what you believe about the resurrection. And in the coming two weeks, this Sunday and next Sunday, we're going to not only look at the foundational teachings of the resurrection, in summary form, but also we're going to delve deeply into the scripture, especially next Sunday, and apply the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to the daily life of the believer and look at some of the ways in which you and I should at least occasionally come into contact with the power of Christ's resurrection that enables us to live above the world of flesh and the devil. The power of the resurrection provides inseparable union with Christ himself. And without him, we can do nothing. Mm. Without the power of his spirit, bringing Christ close and renewing his grace in our hearts, we cannot enjoy spiritual marital union with the living Lamb of God. So on this Resurrection Sunday, let's consider two truths briefly in quick summary and then move on to some other basic teachings about the resurrection and God willing the next time I occupy this pulpit we'll look at some of the deeper truths related to how sanctification how Christian maturity how holy living is connected with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ how to apply resurrection power to our lives we're going to look at some of the foundational teachings about that today. And we'll do this by examining the close relationship, like I said, between the resurrection and sanctification. And to do that, we have to look at some of the foundational, fundamental teachings of the scripture on the resurrection to understand how we build on top of that same resurrection power, which justified us. It's the same resurrection power that sanctifies us. Looking back to Philippians 3.10, we saw that I may know him and the power of resur his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Let me just briefly state two aspects of sanctification which have a negative and positive element to them. I'll develop this more fully, like I said, in part two. The first is positive. Verse 3.10a of Philippians, rather verse 10a of Philippians 3, where we read that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Mm. This refers to the knowledge of Christ and the fellowship it provides with him that the power of Christ's resurrection creates in us. This verse says that I may know him, that's the knowledge of God, mm. and the power of his resurrection. It is the power of his resurrection that diffuses, that pours out into our hearts fellowship or the knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. 
And so to know Christ means to experience the power that comes to believers based on Christ's resurrection. And this power is renewable. Just like when you sleep at night and you wake up in the morning, you're fresh, your physical strength is renewed. Transfer that analogy to the realm of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit renews our spiritual strength by the power of Christ's resurrection. Secondly, look, we'll look at the negative element in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Verse 310b, it says, And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now this describes the process of mortifying sin, mm -hmm. killing sin, crucifying sin, controlling and subduing sin, and overcoming temptation, and dying to self. These are all phrases that describe this negative element that has a positive effect. That is, this phrase, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And so this is accomplished only by resurrection power. We suffer in this world in many ways as believers, but there's an internal suffering. There's this internal monster that needs to be silenced, needs to be controlled. It's called remaining corruption, remaining sin, the old man. And so resurrection power supplies fresh strength to the new man, to the principle of righteousness deposited in our spirits. And this principle of righteousness is at war with the old man internally. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And so there are sanctifying benefits to both the positive aspect of sanctification, that is knowing him and the power of his resurrection, which means that the Holy Spirit provides fresh experience of the knowledge of Christ in terms of the Holy Spirit proclaims and reveals the glorious, lovely, precious personality traits to Christ to our spirit with such impact we have this amazing realization of the greatness of Christ that truly is revealed to our spirit. And our response to a fresh taste of Christ's presence and preciousness, his love, his joy, his admirable and glorious personality traits, his goodness, his compassion, his patience, causes us to go deeper in our knowledge of him. And the Holy Spirit does this. It provides such positive reinforcement, causes assurance of salvation, causes us great delight to have a fresh revelation of the mind of Christ, of the personality of Christ, of the presence of Christ. This is a very, very positive element of sanctification that the resurrection power of Christ applied to us causes within our lives as Christians. And this ought to be a regular, even daily experience to some small or greater degree in the life of the Christian. The second element, a negative element, which it's negative in nature because we have to battle against sin. And that war against sin is inherently distasteful and wearisome and grievous to our spirits. But there's always a positive result, even though there's a negative aura an atmosphere surrounding this battle with sin, yet it always yields positive results, and that is the, the resurrection power of Christ enables us to avoid temptation, to escape temptation, to resist temptation. The resurrection power of Christ lifts us up above the temptations of this life, enabling the strength of that temptation to to eventually subside and go away. The resurrection power enables us to say no to sin for some small or great amount of time. The resurrection power 
provides fresh hatred and loathing for sin, that we might see sin's deceitfulness and goal for what it is and run from it. So that's a positive benefit, if you ask me, even though there's a negative description and a negative element of the warfare. And so there are sanctifying benefits to both of these, though one of them, like I said, is negative in nature. They both require resurrection power to make the benefits a reality in your life. So you and I ought to be and need to be tapping into the resurrection power of Christ to enjoy on the positive side the glories of Christ, the presence of Christ, the joy of our salvation on the one hand, and on the other hand, we need the power of Christ to keep sin at bay. But like I said, before we get to these two points in detail, I would be remiss if I didn't lay out a summary of the doctrine of the resurrection, which we will lay out in the rest of this message. Those who are saved can always hear about the resurrection. It, it thrills my soul. I don't know about you. But when I hear about the fact that my salvation is not based on something I have to do to try to secure by my own strength, by my own mm -hmm. works for the rest of my life, but my resurrected soul and my future in glory with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is permanently secured based on the resurrection of Christ that took place approximately 2,000 years ago, it thrills my soul. It delights my heart. But too often our churches, in our churches, the resurrection of Christ is a doctrine of secondary importance. Mm -hmm. And this ought not to be the case. And may God have mercy upon our pastors, our preachers, and our churches, that in our teachings we would elevate the doctrine of the resurrection to that place of primacy where it needs to be. Because if we don't hear about the resurrection often, if we're not reminded and exhorted by the doctrine of Scripture, the doctrine of the resurrection, how can we get from the place of resurrection and justification to actually experience the power of resurrection, the resurrection in our daily lives, in sanctification. So we need to be reminded that no resurrection power, no growth in sanctification. The resurrection is neglected and forgotten, for the most part, not in many, not all churches rather, but for the most part, until Easter comes around each year, and the same disregard for the resurrection is seen in how we share the gospel as well. What do you mean by that? Well, Christians tend to gloss over the resurrection very quickly when we share the gospel with unsaved people. <clears throat> we tend to share the gospel as if Jesus died at the cross, and that's the end of the story. The story doesn't end with death, even the death of our Savior. The triumph and victory comes in the resurrection. Amen. And that's the hope and guarantee that you share with those who are lost. Everywhere you turn in this world is death. Look at your face in the mirror every morning and you'll see a slow death taking place. Everywhere we turn is deterioration and death, entropy, Everything is going down of the creation and of the spirits of everyone who is created, including their bodies. And it will all result in the elements melting with fervent heat. Everything will be destroyed and God will make a new heavens and a new earth. Based on what? Based on the resurrection power of God to create all things new. And life and newness of life and renewal of life is the very is part of the very nature of God and it is part of the work that he does in his creation. He creates life, he sustains life, and he renews life. And if you're not part of that trifold process, you don't know the glory and the joy of the resurrection because the resurrection is all about life. And so, when we share the gospel, we talk about the atonement and the death of Christ, very important. We can't make a beeline from there to 
appealing to the lost person to repent and believe. This is contrary to the example of Peter in his sermon in Acts chapter 4. Or Acts 2, verse 22. Turn over there to Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. And in several places in the book of Acts, the resurrection of Christ is the linchpin of the sermon that both Peter and Paul preach and the other apostles. In Acts 2.22 we read, Men of Israel, Peter says, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Notice that Peter doesn't end his gospel sermon at the cross. But he gives a full sentence explanation, just like he did about the cross, defining the resurrection. God raised up the Lord Jesus Christ, loosed the pains of death, and it was not possible that he should be held by it. And so the cross is central to our salvation. Well, what God accomplished there is incomplete unless the tomb is empty on Sunday morning, the following Sunday. Therefore, the resurrection of Christ is vital for us to experience salvation because he takes the same resurrection power and resurrects our souls with it and by it. And we call that regeneration. We call that the new birth. <clears throat> Therefore, how exactly does he do this? Well, the resurrection of Jesus is important for several reasons. First, the resurrection witnesses to the immense power of God himself. Nobody has power to create life and to sustain life and raise life except God himself. Even doctors who may treat patients and bring temporary healing, they're all going to die anyway, eventually. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. If God exists and if he created the universe and has power over it, then he has power to raise the dead. Only he who created life can resurrect it after death. Only he can reverse the hideousness that is death itself. And only he can remove the sting of death and gain the victory over the grave. In resurrecting Jesus from the grave, God reminds us of his absolute sovereignty over life and death. No one else has this control. The resurrection of Jesus is also important because it validates who Jesus claimed to be. Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed many amazing things about himself. He claimed to be the Messiah. According to Jesus, his resurrection was a sign from heaven that authenticated his ministry. The resurrection of Christ, attested to by hundreds of eyewitnesses after his resurrection, provides irrefutable proof that he is indeed God and Savior. Another reason the resurrection of Christ is important is that it proves his sinless character and his divine nature. The resurrection of Christ says that Jesus is God and in him is no sin. The resurrection said God's Holy One would never see corruption as Pastor Owen read from Psalm 1610. And Jesus what? Never saw corruption, did he? Even after he died, he didn't see corruption. It was based on the resurrection of Christ that Paul preached in Acts 13. Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, he said. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ not only validates his deity, that he is God, 
when he said, Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. He claimed to be Jehovah God, the great I am of the Old Testament, the <laughs> eternal self-existent, self-attesting, self-revealing God. But it also validates the Old Testament prophecies that foretold of the Messiah's suffering and resurrection. The famous passages in Isaiah 53, of course, but there are over 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them to the letter. Christ's resurrection also authenticated his own claims that he would be raised on the third day. Destroy this temple, he said, and on the third day I will raise it again. He was referring, of course, to the temple of his body. Of course, the Jews with prophesied blindness didn't understand he was talking about himself and not the physical temple that they worshipped in. And so if Jesus Christ is not resurrected, then we have no hope that we'll be either resurrected as well. In fact, apart from Christ's resurrection, we have no Savior, no salvation. Who's going to save us if Jesus did not rise from the dead? What hope do we have in the next life? What guarantee of victory? What security do we have that our salvation will not fade away or be lost? It's the resurrection that everything Jesus said about himself, about who he was, and about those who believe in him would come true. And it did. Mm -hmm. And here you are in a church worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ praising him for his resurrection. It's because the power that rose him from the dead in time, in whenever you became a Christian, 2,000 or so years later, sought you out and raised you from the dead and affirmed that he did rise from the dead because we are saved by the same power. We are raised into newness of life by the same power. Praise God. Thank God for that. And so, if there is no resurrection, our faith would be useless, it would be in vain, our gospel would be altogether powerless, it couldn't change a life, it couldn't save a soul, and our sins would remain unforgiven, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's a bold statement. Either he is or he's not, either he was or he's not. That's a real bold statement to make. And he is. He raised himself from the dead. And he raised us from the dead. He is the resurrection and the life. And in that statement, he claimed to be the source of both. So there's no resurrection apart from Christ. No eternal life apart from him. Jesus does more than just give life. He is life. And that's why death has no power over him. He is life itself. And everything that has life is connected with him and is preserved by him. Jesus confers his life on those who trust in him so that we can share his triumph over death. Remember, you share as a believer in his triumph over death. He imparts that victory to you. He shares that victory with you. You are a joint heir, a co-heir with Christ in all the benefits of his salvation, especially in the resurrection and the benefits that he provides in justification and regeneration based on the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, after you are born from above, he continues to renew you by that same resurrection power. That has to remain a priority in our lives daily. Christianity is all about renewed resurrection power. We who believe in Jesus Christ will personally experience resurrection because having the life Jesus gives, we have overcome death. And we in our daily lives prove through that power that on our behalf, Jesus has overcome death for us. Our bodies are deteriorating, yes, but in our spirits, we are new. And we will overcome, and we will be given a new body. And this is a day 
in which we every year are reminded of the breadth and the spectrum and some of the depth of the resurrection. And I hope that we make reference to it also frequently throughout the year in other sermons and in other studies from Scripture. And so, therefore, with that background, it's impossible for death to win over us ever because Jesus has already secured the victory through his resurrection. And if someone or something can snatch that victory out of the hand of Christ mm -hmm. on his throne somehow, some way, then we will lose our victory too in him and through his mm -hmm. loss. But that will never happen. So let me close with a few points concerning the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Number one, our regeneration is grounded in the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. Our regeneration is grounded in the resurrection of Christ. The Bible doctrinally, scripturally, biblically, theologically, use whatever definition you want, teaching from our Lord over and over and over again says that the salvation and the new life, the new birth that we receive is based on the resurrection of Christ. The Holy Spirit being the Trinity's representative to apply salvation benefits to the daily life of a believer does so based on the resurrection power that he provides when he calls us, when he effectually draws us to himself. The power of Christ begins to work in us and prepare us for salvation. Or to use another word, for conversion. To that abrupt, definitive time when we are changed inwardly and given a new nature and a new spirit. That is the power of God dispensed into us by the Holy Spirit of God. Have you ever read about the resurrection in the Bible and said, praise God? Have you ever during your devotions come across passages that teach the resurrection and you just had to pause and thank God for it? Because Christ has risen Therefore, you can praise God that you are risen because Christians identify with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. resurrection. Baptism is the best metaphor I can think of of that. You're telling everyone at a baptism service when you got baptized, most recently, our brother Yared, mm -hmm. that I'm not that old Yared. I'm, my old life is buried. And going under the water, I am saying... I died to myself and sin. That old life is buried. And positively, I am raised from the dead by the power of Christ's resurrection. Because Christ has risen, I have risen. Maybe my body is still struggling and feeling the effects of sin and the consequences of sin, but someday I'll get a new body. But my spirit, in my spirit, he has preserved me, and in some ways, I'm getting stronger and stronger in the faith. I'm getting deeper in my convictions over the years. I'm, I'm falling in love more and more with Jesus Christ. I admire him more. I love him more. I know more about him, not just on a doctrinal level, but I know more about his heart, his feelings towards me his commitment to me, because the longer I live in this wicked world as a Christian, the longer I experience his faithfulness and his, to me and his love for my soul. If we truly understand the implications of Christ's resurrection for our salvation, the new birth would be the first place to turn. Look at the radical change he made in our lives and the effects it had in changing us. It's all based on you and I partaking of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to change us. And you could not resist that change, even though it began small and grew from there. Ultimately, no one can resist the power of God to save a soul and change a soul and transform a soul into the image of Christ as God 
fulfills his decree and his overall plan to build and to save and to purify and to glorify for himself a bride and a church that he has given to his son to enjoy holy union and communion with his son forever. Mm. That's what the resurrection power of Christ has done in our individual lives and will continue to do until the last soul is saved, until the last soul is caught up with God in heaven and this mortality puts on immortality and the church is perfected. Our salvation is consummated, is completed. That which has been given to us in seed form, that deposit that was placed in our hearts upon conversion will turn into the full, full reward of salvation and glorification. And so God's supernatural act whereby the Spirit makes us a new creation in Christ, replacing our heart of stone with a heart of flesh, is only possible because Jesus is risen. Mm -hmm. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. We read, Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us mm -hmm. again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The term begotten us again, referring to Christians, is a term speaking of the new birth. And we've experienced the new birth through or by, the verse teaches, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The power of that resurrection was bestowed and transferred upon all his people through the centuries, through the millennia, causing the new birth. So according to Peter, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The same God who raised Christ from the grave has also raised us from spiritual death to spiritual life. Can you thank him for that? Can you praise him for that? And the Apostle Paul says, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God being rich in mercy made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is permanent theology etched in scripture that has become a reality in our lives if you and I are Christians. He has made us alive together with Christ. And so we share with Christ in the resurrection. We identify with Christ in the resurrection power of God. He was raised and we are raised. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So not only did the resurrection bring about our conversion and our regeneration, but it brought about a permanent one because we are seated with him positionally. That cannot be reversed. Our status permanently is that we are raised with him and seated with him. Even though we are not there yet in terms of the consummation of our faith, yet we might as well be because it is a sure fact. He promised that we are seated with him in the heavenly places where all of the decrees of God and all of the determined plans of God are issued and carried out by his mighty power and by his angels and all the other instruments that he uses like his providence to implement his perfect plan. And so he can make statements like, you and I are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And like I said earlier, if someone or something can enter those heavenly places in the third heaven where God's special presence exists and change those decrees so that we are no longer seated with Christ and we become unseated, then we will lose our salvation. But that 
will not happen. Secondly, sanctification is rooted in the resurrection of Christ. You see, because God has raised Christ from the dead, He can make us alive together with Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, Christ's resurrection life is the very basis and means by which we are born again. And from there, sanctification is rooted in the same resurrection power. In Romans 6, Paul explains that we can walk in newness of life. That's an interesting phrase. It's a phrase that's unique for the Bible. It's an active word, this, this idea of walking in newness of life. It's an ongoing experience because Christ was raised from the dead. We're not to continue in sin. For how, as Paul asked, can we who died to sin live in it any longer? We've been baptized into the death of Christ. We've been joined to Christ in so many ways. We identify with Christ. The new man is dominant so that we can never lose our salvation. On the contrary, little by little, the new man continues to grow, even though the old man and its remaining corruptions continue to, to wreak havoc upon our lives, yet the new man is more dominant. It is a stronger force at work and a greater dynamic that continues to help us grow over a lifetime in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Paul says that we've been baptized into his death, mm -hmm. he says also that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And this walking depicts an ongoing, lifelong, mm -hmm. progressive experience of the believer in tasting, partaking, and experience of the power of God that does, over a lifetime, incrementally increase the presence and power of God in our lives. Mm -hmm. And God have mercy upon the multitudes of professing Christians which occupy the majority of our churches that know nothing of what I am describing in this message concerning the relationship between the Christian life or sanctification and the resurrection. They know nothing of it. Their entire Christianity is bound up and defined by symbols and words and rituals and ceremonies and confessions of faith, but they know nothing of the power, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to change their lives. And it should cause us to tremble and to weep at the state of affairs in this sense, even at the thought that there might be one or two of them in our own church, among our own members. But Paul isn't finished. He has much to say about the resurrection and sanctification. Turn with me to Romans 6. Romans 6. Beginning at verse 5. Let's pick it up at verse 5. Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Let's stop there. Now, you look at yourself today and you say, Pastor Joe, I, I have a really hard time relating to that statement in Romans 6, 5 and 6. Okay, I can understand that. Concerning the, of the fact that you've been united with Christ in the likeness of his resurrection and that the body of sin, that the body of sin might be be done away with, that, that you're no longer a slave of sin. You say, I have so much struggles with sin on a daily basis. The last day or two has been rough. The last week or two has been rough, you say. 
Well, go back to the beginning of your salvation. Do you see any growth? Mm. Do you see any progress at all? Well, yes. Well, it doesn't say here in Romans 6 that sanctification is accomplished in one day. And if you just go back one day, you may get discouraged. But if you go back to the beginning, you see that slow, steady growth. Mm -hmm. You're not what you want to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. And God, however painful the process is, is changing you little by little. So when you read this, read it with the larger perspective that he's referring here to the believer who grows over a lifetime in his hatred for sin. He grows in the, the amount of victories he gets over sin. They do become more abundant. They do become more lasting. Those victories and triumphs do become more and more frequent. Verse 7, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That freedom from sin comes incrementally, little by little, litty by litty, <laughs> over a lifetime. You have to read that into this because there are other places in the New Testament that teach about the nature of progressive sanctification. And so when you compare Scripture with Scripture, you get a bigger and better picture of how sanctification works over a lifetime. Whereas if you just read this one passage about sanctification, you may get discouraged because you may be misreading it in the light of what the rest of the Bible has to say about how God actually sanctifies us and how we experience more and more of the power in our daily lives of Christ's resurrection. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death, listen, that he died, verse 10, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also. You talk about relevance? The relevance of the resurrection power of Christ in our daily lives? Right here is a transitional point, a powerful, major, transitional point in the larger context of Romans 6, where he brings his teaching on the resurrection power of Christ into the Christian life and how it should affect us, how it should change us. He says, likewise, you also. And based on the teaching of Romans 6, concerning how believers identify with Christ in his baptism and in his resurrection. The argument here of the apostle is that our identification is not merely theological, theoretical, positional. Our status in terms of our identification with Christ is not merely in the heavenlies. Mm. The Holy Spirit provides the power of Christ to cause our identification to be subjective, realistic on a daily basis, something that internally and spiritually changes us and affects us. Now, like I said, lest you get discouraged, the Bible teaches it's not an overnight process. And sometimes we have more defeats than victories. And sometimes we can go weeks and months and even years without sensing the power of God working in our lives. And there are many reasons for that, which I don't have the time to get into. We'll touch on, on some of those things next week, or next time, God willing, not next week, but next message mm. in part two. But when he says, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What he's saying also in the larger mm. picture is that the Christian life is no longer identified with death on a permanent, regular, ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. Now when we talk about the word death, we can take that word out and substitute it with the word weakness, mm -hmm. or powerlessness, or lukewarmness, or impotence. 
The Christian life is no longer when a person becomes regenerated and born from above, is no longer dominated by weakness and death and impotence, having no joy in Christianity, having no power to subdue sin over a lifetime. There has to be some change initially, abruptly upon conversion, where the mind, the heart, the will, and the spirit is changed, is regenerated, is raised from the dead. And from that point, little by little, sin slowly loses its grip and influence and domination to be able to keep us in bondage as slaves of sin like it used to. This is the whole point of our identification with Christ. The Christian life is not to keep our pocket confession of faith. And every time we have a question about Christianity or a need, we take out our pocket Bible dictionary or our pocket confessional and we look that part up there and we're reminded, oh yeah, that's what a Christian is supposed to be. No, no. Learning doctrine is part of it and it's an important part of it because doctrine brings necessary tests of true Christianity to make sure we're on the right path and on the narrow road. But God has designed our identification with Christ and the relevance and reality of true Christianity to be brought home to our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And why do you think the Bible says that God's Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? It is the power of Christ's resurrection through the person and personality of the Holy Spirit who brings home to our hearts with fresh joy and fresh remembrance and fresh assurance who we are and how we've been changed by the power of God and He dispenses a fresh amount of it into our hearts again so that we can rejoice and be reminded, I am saved, I am forgiven, I am growing, He loves me. We can throw away the daisy and no longer go, He loves me, He loves me not, He loves me, He loves me not. All doubt evaporates when the power of Christ's resurrection is applied with fresh reality. And that's why He says we're dead to sin as a lifestyle. Do we still sin? Yes. Shall we sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. Do we have permission to sin one time in anything? No, be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. However, sanctification is a mystery, like many other teachings shrouded in mystery in the Bible. And so... We are alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign, control, mm -hmm. dominate in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Let us remember that we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises in the Bible that by these promises we have become partakers of the divine nature. And these promises are given to us like the refilling of the Holy Spirit, like the power of God to be able to overcome a particular besetting sin, like the need to have doubts and fears and depression and stress evaporated from us and be brought back into the light and into the fresh experience of God's love and the joy of our salvation. All of those promises are given to his church to bring to him. We have no strength or power in and of ourselves. But when we come confessing our sins, acknowledging our impotence and weakness and inability to pull ourselves out of sloughs of despond, or despair, or depression. We come to the Lord with His promises and we say, Lord, You've given me dozens of passages in the New Testament, lengthy passages that describe believers as those who experience Your power to be able to overcome this snare mm -hmm. 
that I have fallen into, this sin that I'm wrestling with, pour out a fresh measure of that upon me and see if God doesn't do it. God never promises anything that he doesn't fulfill when we trust him and we claim those promises before him. God never teases us. He doesn't play games with us. He doesn't laugh at us. He may test us, but his tests always have a positive, wonderful purpose and plan mm. to help us grow in our Christian faith. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your great and precious promises that by these we may be partakers, mm. partakers of your divine nature. And we pray that we would, each of us, know the power of the resurrection more frequently, even daily, in one form or another, that we might overcome every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us. And for those who know not Christ, who are not born from above, who have not known his power, whether they be religious or not, we pray that those hearing this word, this message from your scripture, would truly be given that freedom, that emancipation as a slave of sin, and be brought into your kingdom and be raised from the dead by the amazing power of Christ's resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>